In this episode of Compliance into the Weeds, Tom Fox and Matt Kelly take up a recent survey about the attitudes of employees regarding mandated vaccinations to return to the office. We take a look at the potential whistleblower possibilities and what the regulatory and social media outlook would be. Compliance into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Matt, could you tell the audience where you are uh, for this recording and what you're up to this week? Sure, Tom. So for the first time in, I think, about 19 or 20 months, I am actually on the road. I am at the uh, annual conference of the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics in Las Vegas, uh, where there are, I think, probably around 650 people or so who are downstairs at the convention center right now. But uh, the live events are, are back on and happening. So it's been a good conference so far. So Matt, last week you wrote a blog post about a uh, report or survey that you uh, read, uh, <clears throat> which was put out by a outfit called Blind, an online service that allows professional workers to talk anonymously. And they surveyed some 5,200 workers uh, asking what they think about vaccine mandates and how they would respond if their company was not following through on vaccination requirements. Uh, What did you find so interesting about this survey and its report? Yeah, sure. So basically, this report caught my eye because, uh, as you said, they surveyed more than 5,200 people in their their groups. And what Blind does is it is like an anonymous online chat board, but uh, it is anonymous chat boards for specific companies. And you must first register with Blind as a user using your company email address so they know that you are a member of that company that you want to talk about. Uh, then, as I understand it, for privacy and security, they will get rid of your email address, so nobody's tracking what you're secretly talking about on Blind. But it is this online chat service that gives people uh, free reign to really vent what they want to say about their companies. And so Blind came up with this study that found 46% of their users, who are generally white-collar employees, but 46% of the 5,200 people they surveyed, said that they would report their employer to OSHA if their employer does not impose a vaccination mandate or mandatory testing per the Biden administration's new proposals to really drive vaccine uh, vaccination rates upward across the country. And I think that was on September 9th. The Biden administration said that they were going to impose this new standard for any business with more than 100 employees, either implement a mandate or have mandatory, I think, weekly testing of employees that somebody's going to have to pay for, uh, really trying to turn up the pressure on companies to embrace vaccination mandates so we can all get back to work and get on with our lives. Uh, And here comes Blind saying that if you don't do that, employer, 46% of employees at your business are going to be ready to drop a dime to OSHA to tell them, we're not doing the vaccine mandate, please come investigate my business. Uh, 33% of the groups, uh, the employees polled, said that they would not uh, report their employer, and another 21% or so said they were not sure. But this did intrigue me because, number one, I know vaccination mandates are probably the most pressing, difficult policy decision a lot of companies are struggling with today and what they want to do. Uh, It, thanks to conservatives and their anti-vaccination, anti-mandate attitudes, uh, they are generally very anti-mandate, and yet most of the country, and especially most professional employees, are very pro-mandate. So if you are a large business and you might have multiple types of groups in your workforce, you've got a professional class, you have a sales team, you have maybe a unionized group of factory workers or something like that, how are you going to grapple with vaccination mandates as a whole enterprise? Uh, and I was talking with a compliance officer just at the SCCE conference earlier today where they said that they're really struggling with what to do because if they implement the mandate, they have a large factory workforce that they suspect the union is going to go bananas over that and they suspect a some portion of their factory workers are going to quit 
in protest rather than get vaccinated, well, there's a labor shortage. So how are you going to replace them? But if you don't do that, then you still have these 46% in your white-collar workforce who say that they're going to call OSHA and report you. So, Tom, there's a lot that you could think about here about how to try and approach these mandates, and it really just jumped out at me that it was a very interesting look at some of the challenges big businesses are having today with COVID. Matt, I guess the first thing that struck me in uh, your comments was uh, a difference in perception of white-collar and blue-collar workers around vaccination status, and that is this going to be one more uh, unfortunate event that cleaves even further uh, those two economic groups uh, apart further? Much to my concern, I think that might be the case, that we, for various big demographic reasons, Tom, we could talk about all day long, but it does seem like that the U.S. population in particular and the workforce that we are we're drifting into these two poles of, on one pole are highly educated workers who are generally going to be white collar. They are generally now affiliating with the Democratic Party, and they are largely vaccinated, and they are largely in support of va- uh, vaccination mandates because, big deal, we're already vaccinated and we want to get on with our lives. That is way over on one pole. And then the polar opposite, you could say that you've got a lot of uh, blue collar workers who probably are less educated and they are uh, also tending to skew now towards the Republican Party, which the single biggest determinant right now, are you Democrat or Republican, is whether you have a college degree or not. Uh, So there's that. And then they also are drifting towards anti-vax misinformation and nonsense on the internet and their anti-vaccine mandate as well. And you have these two groups that are really becoming diametrically opposed on multiple levels. And if you're a big enterprise, I'm not really sure how you do grapple with this. The other thing that I thought was interesting about the blind survey, Tom, was that they asked a second question, not just would you report your employer if they weren't implementing the mandate. They asked, mandate aside, or you know, would you report your company for violating the mandate? Put that aside. What do you think about vaccine mandates just in general and what the Biden administration is proposing? A large a number of these poll uh, survey respondents were in favor of the vaccine mandates generally. 76% of those 5,200 workers said they think vaccination mandates as proposed by the Biden administration are good and they support them. Much larger than the only 46% who said And also, I would turn in my company if they don't do it. But it just goes to show that among professional businesses and, you know, there are going to be whole sectors that don't really even have a blue collar workforce to worry about. So if you're a tech firm, if you're a financial services firm, if you're a professional services firm, your employees are probably all almost white collar. And they are probably to a very great extent all vaccinated. And they think that a vaccination mandate is perfectly fine. And my question is more about how are you going to square this important and sometimes sizable, depending on your business, block of workers who are very pro-vaccination, very comfortable with vaccine mandates, and a good number of them who will even report you if you don't go along with that too, and you're not in compliance with the Biden administration's uh, push for vaccine mandates. You know, you've got all of that. Are they going to get more and more fed up with the anti-mandate crowd? And, you know, you see it all over the South. The hospitals are full. The schools are getting closed or they can't remain open. It's just there's still a lot of chaos there because people aren't vaccinated. And so now the virus is still running rampant in places like Texas and uh, Alabama and Mississippi and Florida. We don't yet know if we're going to see all of that in the Northeast where our COVID season isn't going to kick in really until like, probably November through February, seems to be when we last year had the highest levels of cases. But in a very highly vaccinated state, we're not going to have to deal with a lot of school closures, for example, or the hospitals aren't going to be uh, busting at the seams like they are down south. So I'm just wondering if this tension between vaccination and unvaccinated, these two blocks how is this going to manifest at big companies? Isn't it going to get difficult in, in a policy perspective? How are you going to figure out what the right policy is? How are you going to figure out 
how to deal with uh, recalcitrant employees who aren't going to get vaccinated? What are you going to do about people who won't call OSHA that you're not enforcing it, but they might call your employee hotline to say, well, you know, so-and-so is not vaccinated, or this unit isn't implementing the vaccine mandate that corporate HQ said. We're going to have all of these questions, and they're going to come to your business really soon. So that's what was intriguing about the blind survey, too, is we got a lot of this tension coming up to the surface. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Look, 2020 has proven to be the year of many things, and the same for 2022. But if you're a small business, this could also be the year you switch to a better payroll. Gusto wasn't just built for small businesses, it was built for the people behind them. Their online payroll is easy to use. Gusto can automatically calculate paychecks and file all your payroll taxes, which means you have more time to run your business. Plus, Gusto does way more than payroll. Gusto helps with time tracking, health insurance, 401ks, onboarding, commuter benefits, offer letters, access to HR experts. You get the idea. It's super easy to set up and get started. If you're moving from another provider, they can transfer all your data for you. It's no surprise that 94% of customers are likely to recommend Gusto. And here's the best part. Because you're a listener to this podcast, you get three months totally free. All you have to do is go to gusto.com backslash compliance. That's gusto.com backslash compliance. I'm telling you, you're going to love Gusto. Get started today. So let me go down the union rabbit trail a little bit, Matt. Why couldn't the company go to the union and say, we're going to negotiate with you over the change in a term and condition of employment, and that's vaccination status? And typically a union would say, okay, we'll negotiate. What are we going to get? And why couldn't a company implement uh, both a package of incentives uh, and disincentives, something like uh, Delta Airlines did or an incentive of $100 or some other benefit to try to drive uh, vaccination. And if it's not a union uh, shop, a company could do that unilaterally. But once again, we have seen uh, a package of incentives and disincentives work in other corporate settings. Why couldn't you take that to the manufacturing side of a business as well? I, I think that you probably could. It would get a little bit tricky Um, It's interesting that you bring that up because living in Boston, I have a number of acquaintances and colleagues who work in higher education where they are unionized, but they're also white collar unions. So I know several college campuses up here, for example, where they implemented vaccine mandates for students, for faculty, for most staff who were non-unionized. And then they said, we are going to negotiate with our union employees but these were all white collar union employees anyways. And the unions basically knew that they were going to give in. It was just a matter of how much more money can we get from the administration. But it was never any scenario where they were thinking for real that, no, we're not going to accept a vaccination mandate. All of their members were already off getting vaccinated anyway. So it was just an easy way for them to squeeze a bit more out of the administration. That's a union's job. I don't begrudge a union for doing that. But That is when you have unionized white-collar employees. And if I were a tech firm, I would also be thinking about that dynamic, too, because that's how it's going to manifest there. But if you're in a manufacturing unit where maybe the union is largely blue-collar and you might have a significant portion of them who are, you know, listening to talk radio morons who think that the vaccine is a conspiracy or they're reading Facebook disinformation... And they're, they, they legitimately, they don't want to get vaccinated. It's not just a matter of what else can we get. It's like they don't want to do it, period. And so if this gets bogged down in a union negotiation, it could take longer. It could cost you a lot more money. Um, and you're think, going to have to start thinking through, do I want to incentivize people to get vaccinated or do I want to flip the script, kind of like what Delta Airlines did, and said, if you don't want to get vaccinated, that's fine, but we're going to charge you a higher health care premium, which I think also I've got no objection to that, because if you're unvaccinated, you're assuming a greater health risk. So why shouldn't you pay more? 
Um, but you're going to need to be thinking through what is the right calculus here or what is the right recipe of ingredients? How much do we want to give to unions to see if they will move on this? And how much do we want to penalize employees generally if they aren't going to want to move on it? But, you know, there's a world of difference between unions that already know we're going to do this because that's what our members are wanting anyways, and unions that don't want to do it because a lot of their membership doesn't want to do it, period. And so I look at a higher education union and I see a very different sort of set of variables to think about than looking at a union of manufacturing employees or entry-level retail workers or something like that, where they're going to have a very different view about if they want a mandate at all. And it's going to be tough. So what about the privacy issue, number one, for the, the individual employee and their vaccination status? But how do we begin to think through that from a compliance and ethics perspective for employees who feel uncomfortable or don't even want to be around an unvaccinated person. Does that co-employee have any rights, uh, either under privacy or, or other internal HR uh, type analysis, or is is that another imbroglio for another day? No, I think that's a good point because you wind up with two different laws or impulses that I think are in tension with each other um, under labor standards and labor safety standards, a company is obligated to create a safe working environment for its employees. And you could make the argument that letting a willfully unvaccinated person then show up and risk infecting everybody else with a potentially fatal illness, that is not safe. So you should not let that person in. So you should therefore try to implement a vaccine mandate, which by the way, that's a third impulse now is like, let's not forget the Biden administration is pushing this really hard. You have a regulatory compliance obligation to implement the mandate. So you got to figure that out. But at the same time, you do have these privacy concerns. And so are we going to, like what, have a bouncer at the office door who's going to card everybody for their vaccine certificate and documentation? Um, never mind the fact that you can easily fake some of these uh, vaccination cards now. And I mean, are there some crazies out there who are really going to spend $100 on a fake vaccine card instead of just getting one for free, for real. Yes, there are those kooks out there, and they're going to try this. And so how are you going to figure that out? I don't have a good answer for how you can let all of this coexist in some kumbaya harmony. I personally think that you could just cut the Gordian knot and say, we're requiring a vaccine mandate, and if you're not vaccinated, you're not going to be employed after date X. Go and do it. Give some people time off, give them appropriate time off with pay, start a vaccination clinic in the company parking lot or whatever you need to do. And a lot of companies have done all of those things already. And we had mentioned Delta Airlines, Tom, like Delta had done that and they operated one of the biggest vaccination clinics in the state of Georgia from their Delta Museum that they run down in Atlanta, I think. Like a lot of businesses have gone out of their way to solve this by just encouraging everybody to get vaccinated. Clearly, we have this stubborn, irreconcilable, I don't know, 15 or 20 percent who don't want to get vaccinated no matter what. And I don't know necessarily how you're going to solve that problem. Um, and Tom, all of this, let's all remember, we're just talking about the United States. We have not yet broached vaccination mandates in Europe. We haven't broached privacy controls and concerns in Europe, all of which are much harder to implement than here in the United States. And how are you going to handle that? I don't have a good answer for anybody in the European Union about how you would solve that either. But it's just it is interesting to see that there is this simmering tension now and companies are going to have to deal with this because if you do not circle back to what you and I said at the beginning there, Tom, 46 percent of your white collar employees are ready to call you out to OSHA to say you haven't solved this problem yet. So they, companies do have a real incentive to try and figure out what you want to do here, what's legal, what's ethical, how are you going to be as accommodating as possible to the most people when certainly there's this population that I don't think you can accommodate them. You can't accommodate anti-vaxxers in the vaccine world. I don't know what else to say about that. OSHA is almost wholly dependent on uh, whistleblowers to report 
noncompliance uh, with vaccination status. And I say that because <clears throat> I think I read this morning that uh, it would take uh, OSHA, with their current number of inspectors, approximately 150 years to check the companies in the United States uh, to make sure they were complying with the vaccine mandate. And uh, so OSHA is, I think, going to be almost 100 uh, percent uh, relying on uh, hotline reports or whistleblower reports or some type of reports directly to OSHA. Do you see that changing uh, any of the dynamics around uh, making people uh, either less afraid to call the government or more open to reporting to OSHA directly? Well, I think that's also a good point is I question, you know, how capable is OSHA to live up to these expectations here? Um, You know, that they're going to be flooded no matter, even if they don't get a whole lot of complaints in absolute numbers, you're right that they don't have a lot of inspectors. They're not going to be able to keep up with whatever comes in. I could see some companies just playing a numbers game and saying, well, you know, OSHA's never going to get around to investigating me. Um, I would warn companies that OSHA is not the only company or regulator that could tie you into knots over vaccination and workplace safety. Uh, People could call up their local state labor inspector and would they have the same bite and strength as OSHA? No. Would they still have enough bite to be a really irritating thing in your day? Yes. Um, Or could employees uh, somehow uh, collect up all the evidence that they have and shotgun this onto Twitter with a clever hashtag and put your company on the back foot and, you know, suddenly you're dealing with this in a social media meltdown? That could also very well happen. Uh, And I think there are a lot of employees who are very sophisticated about this and would know if we can get a snowball rolling on social media about our vaccination problems, OSHA is going to investigate us then, so let's do it. I mean, there's going to be some of that that I think also could be a risk and happen for companies. Um, so there's an awful lot of complexity here, and I don't envy any businesses that are in this position. And it's funny that this is what people have been talking about at the conference here just downstairs, that they really are struggling with how do they manage this administratively? How do they keep track of the privacy requirements? How do they actually keep track of, you know, enforcing a mandate, many of whom are white collar themselves, and this is something they want to do. They are just very aware of how delicate that it could be to do this vaccine mandate in practice. And yet here we have this ticking time bomb of the whether it's 46% or 50 or 35% of employees or whatever it is, there's certainly there's going to be some significant number of your workforce who will be ready to call OSHA to say, you are not doing this mandate like you're supposed to. And you can't ignore that they have that lever to pull. And so there's, there's a lot of pressure here that companies need to think about. Matt, we've had a lot of different topics over the years on uh, compliance into the weeds, but my sneaking suspicion is we're going to be revisiting this uh, more than once over the next few months. I think so too, Tom. ...of compliance into the weeds. I hope you will take a listen or look at the latest addition to the Compliance Podcast Network, Effing Argentina. It's a really fun series where I visit with Greg Greenberg, the author of Effing Argentina, and it's a tale of exasperation in the modern world. Greg wrote 11 short stories of exasperation, and in this season of Effing Argentina, we go through each one. It premieres this week on the Compliance Podcast Network. You can also check it out on YouTube, Effing Argentina. I know you will enjoy it. I hope you'll join Matt and I again next week for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.